Hi friends, today I present a case of phaco emulsification in a patient with hypermature cataract and phacolytic glaucoma. This patient was managed with oral astrozolamide 250 mg four times a day for three days, topical antibiotic steroid combination as well as IV injection mannitol 20%, 100 cc, uh, 15 minutes before the start of the case. When I wash out the phacolytic material from within the eye in order to improve the turbidity of the aqueous and to improve the visibility of the anterior chamber details, I find that I'm dealing with a case of hypermature cataract with fine crystalline particles within the substance of the lens. Trypan blue stain is performed. after which the clear corneal incision is fashioned at uh, 130 degrees in the usual manner of 2.8 millimeters. At this point in time, when I replace the tripen glue with viscoelastin, the crystalline nature of the intralenticular substance is pretty much visible. These crystalline particles occur because of the accumulation of cholesterol as well as calcium oxalate crystals that is presumably lysed out from L membranes of the lens epithelial cells. I'm attempting a capsular excess, which given the fact that there is no posterior support on which to base my capsular excess with the cystotome is quite difficult beyond a certain point. At this juncture, I decided to carry on the rest of the epithelorexis with the help of a utrat of forceps. I grasp the leading tearing edge with the utrat of forceps and I continue to perform the capsulorexis and because I normally do not use the utrata forceps while performing uh, capsular excess. It is slightly challenging for me and therefore I end up creating a smaller capsular excess than I intended. It's very clear that the capsular bag is filled up with a very small, thick, amorphous, dark brown nucleus core. Deciding at this point that the rexus is not big enough to continue with phaco emulsification, I attempt to enlarge the capsular excess with a small snip made at 7 o'clock position. However, with this attempt, I am able to just eccentrically increase the size of the rexus a little bit, but I decide that this would be enough for me to continue with paper emulsification. Now the settings in this particular case is I am working at a vacuum of around 300 millimeters of mercury, a power of 60% using the burst mode FACO. You can see that the nucleus is extremely mobile with the capsular bag and I get instant occlusion with the bevel down position of the FACO tip and because I feel that the thickness of the lens is not much, I do not bury it to the adequate depth. This therefore leads to a situation where I am finding it difficult to initiate the phaco chop. And when I try to bury it a little further and resume the chop, I find that there is not only nucleus rotation but also uneven crack fragments, which is pathognomonic of having a very superficial hold. I finally manage to create a separation into two heminuclei and once I have a nice shelf into which I can bury the phacal tip, I now resume the procedure with a little more courage, bury the phacal tip deep within the amorphous core and I am able to create the fragment separation and a good crack. Using the same parameters that is staying within the burst mode phaco, I am able to eat up this nucleus fragment with relative ease. 
The important points to note is that there is no buffer of epinucleus that will protect the posterior capsule and therefore you have to be very careful while removing these nuclear fragments. Also I find that it is easier to chop this nuclear fragment when you initiate the crack from the periphery rather than from within the center or the substance of the nucleus. The reason for this being that in amorphous nuclei a compressive force is more successful than a shear force in helping to break down the nucleus. From this point on the procedure is quite simple however I reduced the vacuum from 300 to 200. I am scared that the posterior capsule would trampoline and get stuck within my FACO probe. Because this is a Stellaris machine, I cannot change the aspiration flow rate, just the vacuum. And I gradually and slowly eat up the pieces within the safe zone, staying within the center of the eye. Now once this FACO emulsification is completed, there is almost no cortex at all. However, I do a robust irrigation aspiration in the anterior chamber, especially close to the angles of the anterior chamber because I know the phacolytic material may be clogging the trabecular meshwork, which is the reason why the intraocular pressure goes up. So I do a thorough washout of the anterior chamber and close to the angles of the anterior chamber. In this particular patient, in one of the centers that I work, the patient was eligible or the patient opted for a rigid intraocular lens and therefore I chose to implant the 5.25 FACO profile rigid intraocular lens with a PMMA haptic within the capsular bag and I enlarged the incision with a 5.25 millimeter keratome. I inflate the anterior chamber and I also inflate the capsular bag with methyl cellulose and the 5.25 millimeter single piece rigid lens is then passed to the incision. Because the diameter of this lens is about 5.5 millimeters, it is a snug fit but once I get it into the anterior chamber, I lift the trailing haptic slightly to position the leading haptic within the capsular bag. Once this is done, using a Kuglin's hook and engaging it at the haptic optic junction, I am able to push it in a slightly posterior and inferior direction to get the IOL into the capsular bag. I finally wash out the viscoelastic from within the anterior chamber using a Simcoe cannula. Now even though the incision is 5.25 millimeters in size, because of the smooth construction of the incision and because of the fact that IOL insertion did not stretch the lips of the clear corneal incision, you can get by with gentle stromal hydration without having to suture this incision. I found that in many of these cases, because the wound is not distorted by the insertion of the IOL, it's very simple and very easy to close these incisions with gentle stromal hydration and I also found that the net astigmatism contrary to what I believed I would end up with stayed within 0.75 to 1.25 diopters. I thank you for watching.